Tsinwama, that's my native tongue, means welcome. Um, I am a native here of Mendocino County. I'm a Pomo also from Sherwood Valley and um, Pinoleville. I work with public health and I've been in the county now for about three and a half years. I've been working on this issue. So I'm just going to jump right into it. What is an opioid? I like to do a little interaction. So if you have ideas and you already know what this is, chime right in. Does anyone have any idea what an opioid is? So he said it comes from a poppy plant. And that, there's, so there's two types here. That is an opiate, that's the natural form. The opioid is synthetic, and it's what's made in the labs and what our big pharmaceuticals push out, and they're things like painkillers, Oxycontin, Vicodin, right? There's sedatives, Valium, stimulants, Adderall, and Ritalin. For Mendocino County opioid overdose, this is a snapshot. And what you'll see here is the rates of what's been going on. Mendocino County, they've experienced 17 deaths in 2016. And the annual code mortality rate during the period was 19.400,000. So obviously, we don't have 100,000 in our population, so that's a crude rate. I know just as of last year, uh, we had two youth pass from an opioid overdose. One was on the coast and fentanyl was on board. And the other was here inland and um, she was a Native American from my tribe, actually. So this pretty little chart here, I pulled this off the California um, Opioid Overdose Surveillance Dashboard. And you can go there also and you can create these kind of things. This tells us that Mendocino County is fourth in opioid overdose out of 58 counties in California. Yes. Is that per capita? Yes. Does anyone know how heroin or opioids work in the body? Do you know what it affects? Yes, please, orally. The opioids uh, hijack the nucleus incumbent reward system of your brain, which is the reward system of the which brain. Which is the reward system of the brain. <laughs> and it bombs on to your endorphins, basically fools your... It basically fools you into thinking you don't have any pain. So it affects your brain and it affects your, it'll affect your intestines and it does like these crazy little things to your body. It's not a fun deal, actually. So these are the, um, this is what's prescribed to um, our county. Over, over 1,200 um, prescriptions are prescribed per thousand. So that means everybody gets one and a little more, right? There is a, a decrease of 11% in this county of those prescriptions being prescribed um, since this epidemic has started, which is good to a, to a certain degree, right? Some more statistics. I like statistics, can you tell? So motor vehicles are down, um, the accidents per death, but the opioid deaths are up. They're above that which it used to not be that way, right? You used to know that if you got on an airplane, you were pretty safe. If you were in a car, you were more likely to be in an accident than you were to be in a car, uh, airplane crash, right? So now you're more likely to be overdosed on an opioid, which is kind of, you know, that's scary. The age range is usually, it looks like our middle age. Women are also, uh, one of the other statistics that I didn't put up there, it's women that are middle-aged. And the two races that are being hit the hardest are the, let me not say this wrong, white and Native Americans. And so how did this all get started? Why? So basically the opioid epidemic, this is how it all got started. So there was this little article right here that says addiction is rare in patients. And that little article is what the pharmaceuticals ran with. Because you're not going to be addicted. You're not going to have any problem. And it wasn't just that the pharmaceuticals ran with it, so then medical schools ran with it also, because you're not going to be addicted. So our doctors are being trained that you're not going to be addicted. And how do you treat pain? You treat it with an opioid. In their defense, in the doctor's defense, I mean, they were only doing what they were trained to do. And so we have a lot of doctors to this day who have been trained to prescribe these opioids. These are the dollars spent marketing Oxycontin. Pharmaceuticals are making billions of dollars with these drugs. Billions, billions. They're very rich. So rich that 60 Minutes even did a piece on what is happening with the DEA trying to go after the pharmaceuticals. Thank goodness for that 60 Minute episode. 
you haven't seen it, please go to YouTube or 60 Minutes website and pull it up. It's a great piece. Yeah, it's all over the news. So anyways, so the industry uh, educational messages are physicians are needlessly allowing patients to suffer because of opiophobia. Has anyone heard of this? So basically, this is what's happening. So this is my experience in our county because I go out and I do this presentation to the Native Americans. This is my first presentation out in the in the rest of the community. So I go to Consolidated Tribal Health, and I've been up to um, up in Covalo at their Indian Health Service. And what's happening is, is the doctors completely cut off anyone on opioids. Just completely cut you off. No new prescriptions are being made, and that's okay. So what are we doing for pain? What happens to the person who's addicted? Well, there are no other services. So they're freaked out, right? They don't want to give you any more opioids because you can lose your license as a doctor if you're prescribing opioids and this person's picking up an opioid somewhere else. And how are they tracking it? And there's all of these different things that happen, right? So there's this phobia that's going around. And it's not just within, in, within Indian Health Services. It's within our community. There are other doctors also who are struggling with when to prescribe and when not to prescribe. There are a number of docs, not just in our community, but all over, who decided that the best course of treatment is just not to prescribe opioids. But that's not really prudent. You know, because some people actually need them. Like Kyrie said, people need the opioids some people do need them. They're not horrible drugs. They're just not probably the best for a long distance and, you know, for everyone, obviously. So the industry, it, and when I talk about the industry, I'm talking about the pharmaceuticals. They're funding pain as the fifth vital sign. And just recently in November, this was changed, right? Do you know about pain as the fifth vital sign? Do y'all know what that's about? So, um, uh, oh, gosh, back in uh, maybe in the 80s, what, ha what happened, and this was coincided with the whole thing with the use of opioids and, and the beginning of the um, epidemic, what happened was uh, there was a decision made that uh, people should not be in pain. This was not okay. And so pain was decided to be the fifth vital sign that people had to look at, not just blood pressure, not just your height, your weight, those kinds of things. Now, when you go to the hospital, well, not right now, but then uh, when you went to the hospital, for instance, the doctor's next question was, how much pain are you in? And that pain had to be treated. And um, if it wasn't treated appropriately, it was tied to uh, funding for the hospitals. And this, of course, also increased how much, um, how many opioids were being prescribed as well. So, um, the, you know, this was a big part of the opioid uh, epidemic as well. So now, back in this was just happened in November, there was a, um, a letter that came from the AMA. Um, that said that they will no longer support uh, pain as the fifth vital sign. It's something that should be looked at, but not something that uh, is uh, tied to uh, funding or um, needs to be, uh, that you need to prescribe to. So, which is fabulous. This is a huge change. I and mean, this has been going on for since the late 80s. So this is a really big change. One of the first things that you get from the hospital is a letter that asks you, you know, how was your experience and uh, was your pain taken care of as well as how, you know, how was the hospital food and all of these things that you have to rate. And those things are tied to funding for the hospital. They have to rate really high in order for their funding to continue. Now, if pain rating your pain is no longer um, tied to funding, then they no longer have to um, push pain medication on, the, on their, your way out of the door. That, I think, is going to be really huge. A lot of what we do in the coalition um, is to work with prescribers. So um, we do some work with the hospital, but 
uh, or with the hospitals, but a lot of what we do is we work with the pre prescribers. So <clears throat> one of the first thing we did was work with um, the doctors on creating uh, prescribing guidelines that is in there. <laughs> we'll get there. No. So what we did was we created prescribing guidelines for the hospital emergency departments and then the prescribers in the community. Oh, it's already been done for a year, two years, year and a half, something like that. And it went out to all the doctors and actually we just res resent it out last week. Those are agreed upon by the MDs in the community and then sent out to the rest of the MD. Thanks, Kyrie. No problem. So just a little more into this, the unintentional overdose deaths involving opioids parallel with the cells, which shouldn't be too surprising, maybe alarming when you find out, right? So I guess that's what all those commercials are about. So this drug may cause hypertension, depression, all those great things. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about controlling the epidemic, and it's a three-prong um, approach, and this is what the SafeRx Coalition is working on. This is my expertise. This is where I really come into play um, uh, with Kyrie and the rest of the teams that we have working together. We're um, working to prevent new cases of opioid addiction, treat people who are already addicted, and reduce the supply um, from pill mills and the black market. And this is how we're doing this. SafeRx Mendocino has a website. It's at www.saferxmendocino.com. We have a vision of working with the community, and the community is everyone. We're working in the schools, we're working with the sheriff, we're working with police departments all over the county, Ukiah, Fort Bragg, Willits. We're also working with programs like MCYP, um, tribes, and we're showing up and we're, you know, putting out all of this information and giving out log bags and doing um, opioid education. MCYP is in the schools. And um, so our vision is to have a healthy community free of the, you know, the opioids and the stigma that's related to people who are addicted to these opioids. Our main focus was the prescribing practices first. And so that's what the prescribers action team has worked on and they've published and it's on the website that I was just at. They um, also have um, distributed them out to the rest of the community, prescribers. So it's really up to the prescribers once they get them. Are they going to incorporate them or are they not going to incorporate them? And we just keep showing up and giving them the information of, as to why this is really a good idea. What's the receptivity of the prescribers? That's a great question. So normally we have about three to five prescribers who show up monthly to this meeting. I believe there's about 131 in the county. And that's and then it fluctuates between because you know Howard, the hospital and Adventist, um, they the doctors are coming from out of town and they're moving around. So but we do have people from Adventist and um, and uh, Howard show up and they're part of our team pretty much on a regular basis. Um, one of the ways in which I have a, a email list of about 75 providers and they rely on me sending out information to them. So they don't show up, but they get information all the time. So it just because it's a small group who shows up to the meetings doesn't mean that that's all who's involved. So I don't want you to despair, okay? Okay, so what this slide is all about is um, the SafeRx website. And if you click on in the uh, no resources, uh, you will find these documents. And in these documents, we have the emergency uh, department prescribing guidelines. We have the primary care guidelines, naloxone coast pr prescribing guidelines. And you can download all of these, print them out, read them, however, what distribute them, bring them to your doctor, right? Hey, Doc, have you seen this? <laughs> Just wondering, right? Because we're there to ask questions, right? The thing that I always say is make a list of your questions you have for your doctor because every time I get there, I'm like, oh, I can't remember what I'm supposed to be here for other than this cough. This website is interactive. We're trying to update it on a regular basis. If you want information like news that's happening every couple days, we have a Facebook page and it's SafeRx Mendocino. So please find us and like us, right? And share us. We also have Instagram and we have Twitter. 
And so that's, there's news articles being published on a regular basis. And the Instagram is more focused, the pictures, sometimes you'll see the pictures on Facebook and Twitter. And those pictures are really, um, they're loud and they're colorful and they're really to grab a hold of the youth eye, right? And bring them back to, hey, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. And if you see something and you think, oh, I don't know if I understand this or I have input, please comment. The other thing that the um, coalition worked on with the prescribers is Suboxone and the um, MAT, which is medically assisted treatment. Suboxone is a prescription medicine. It contains buprenorphine and naloxone. And the naloxone, it counteracts, right? So it gives them what they need. And this is being done at Mendocino Community Health Clinic. They are up off the ground. They're running. They've been running for almost two years. So, and what happens is, is the patient comes in and these are people who are addicted and they come in, they get their um, suboxone treatment, they see um, a counselor and then they have a group of counseling team and they come in every week. You know, there's other things they're testing for. They're testing for how high their opioid, where it's at and trying to bring them down. It's a, it's a great program, actually. I just know that um, up here, it's uh, John Glyer okay. is um, doing suboxone. Um, and you and McCullough and then in Ukiah it's Mendocino Community Health Clinic I know the emergency room is looking into doing the suboxone and then transferring the patient care back to the clinic um, and then on the coast I can't remember his name it escapes me Golden Dr. Golden and I believe there's another doctor over there also the challenge is is that we don't have very many people who have um, the availability of um, MDs and so they need to have an X license. And an X license for the doctor is four hour training. Is it eight hours? I thought it was eight hours for them. Oh, it's 24 for the PAs. So it's 24 for the PAs and eight hours for the MD to get the X license. And that's, you need to have that to be able to give Suboxone treatments. So the question is, is does Suboxone provide pain relief or, or a lack of craving? Uh, it provides both. So um, it... What it does is it uh, definitely decreases craving, okay, and it makes the patient feel normal. It's a lot like methadone that way. And, um, and then it will also, it has shown some efficacy for pain as well. So probably they're not saying, oh, it's fabulous, but it shows some efficacy for uh, for pain relief. And the advantage over the opioid is? If you're an addict, you're not chasing your high, right? So um, that's a big thing. For another thing, it's much safer than using an opiate, okay? There's no um, threshold, so you're not using it, hitting a threshold, having to increase to deal with your pain. And the other thing about using opiates for pain particularly is that you get to a place, it stops working right and then you have to take more but that doesn't mean that it doesn't continue to affect you you run the risk of um depressing your uh, uh breathing so increased risk of uh overdose is what happens right right you don't develop a tolerance to the suboxone right Yes, Suboxone does deal with the physical withdrawal. So a little bit about addiction. I, I, I really feel a need to like uh, talk about that. So we could be talking about two types of addiction here. Addiction of, say, the grandma who's in the nursing home taking her opioid pain medication as prescribed on time, right? Because the nurse is coming around, and now she's addicted. How does that happen? Well, because this opioid can get be in your system for five days and you can become addicted. That's how strong it is. That's how it connects with your receptors in your brains and that, that place where it says, oh, everything's great, right? And so Suboxone is a great treatment for those kinds of things. It, it also is a good treatment for the addict who, who is an addict. Like, they'll be addicted to the opioid. They'll be addicted to meth. They'll be addicted to alcohol. They'll be addicted to marijuana. But the problem is this, they're still an addict. And it doesn't take away the cravings. I, I know this from my own personal, I, I have family. 
I'm a foster parent because of this epidemic. I have two parents who are out using, right? They don't get their opioids anymore from the doctor, so now they've hit the street. And that is common. You know, I don't want us to be blind about the, you know, the common of what happens to people. You know, one was in a sports injury, the other one had a baby. And, and, and now those babies are with me. So, you know, we need to, you know, kind of keep our eyes open and see how this is really affecting. It's, it's not just the common, I had pain, I had to take pain medicine for the long time, and now I'm gonna get into here and it's all sweet and beautiful. You know, we, we really have an opioid epidemic. Um, if the pain pills are going down and the epidemic is still going up and our death rate is still going up, we still have a problem, right? Our other part of this is how do we save people, right? So we want to save lives. That's, it's huge for us. And in order for us to save lives, we need to do some harm reduction. And that harm reduction includes the Narcan. And so we actually received a grant to, um, and we got some Narcan, and then we got some more Narcan. And then we had this agency called Ages hook up with us, and they're like, hey, we love you guys, and we want to give you more Narcan. And we're like, yes so happy because this is what Narcan is it reverses an overdose right so the person's down they can't breathe or they're going you know they're have they're having laboring for their breath and this little package here you pull it out and you squirt it in their nose and it starts reversing that effect of the opioid because the opioid is saturating the back of the brain and telling your breathing that you don't need to anymore right and so what happens after you've given that first dose you're calling 911 right because you need to get this person to the emergency room. The next thing you're doing within three to four minutes is giving him another dose. No? No. I actually did a training today. She did a training today. <laughs> so the way it works is you give your first dose, and if they don't pull out of it, then you give them a second dose. But you give them... Um, you give them up to, I think, five minutes before you will give them a second dose. Okay, so they ha yet they have to have you have to give them time to respond to the Narcan. Narcan and Naloxone are the same thing. Narcan is a brand name that is this nasal inhaler. Okay, and just so you know, so the Narcan is in the um, Suboxone. And she said it has buprenorphine and naloxone in it. That's to help keep the, uh, <clears throat> it's like one of those things where you, that you keep people from getting high from your medication, right? So anyway, uh, the Narcan, basically what you do is you want to wait five minutes before you give it to them again and you want to be watching their breathing and seeing if it improves. So the question is, is with overdoses, is this primarily with heroin or is it with oxys? And it's both. So naloxone also, um, you don't need a prescription to go get it. You go to your pharmacist and you tell your pharmacist, I want to buy naloxone. They probably won't have it on hand because we're working on them, right? And I believe these last up to two years in your, in your possession. So do we give it away for free? So what we've been doing is um, we've given them um, supplies to McCavin, and McCavin goes out and gives them away. They, if you call McCavin, they, you can talk to them also, right? Libby is the lead on that, and you can get naloxone in your home. We have worked on co-prescribing with opioids. We really want the doctors with a certain MME to prescribe the naloxone along with your opioid medication that you're taking home. She can't help herself. <laughs> so um, this week we sent out a uh, mailing to all the doctors in the county with the prescribing guidelines and the co-prescribing guidelines and a flyer that tells them um, that they can call McCavin and ask McCavin to send um, some Narcan over to them to uh, for a particular patient, like, oh, I, I have a patient who needs it, could you get it to me? Because they have a distribution network. So the, the thing about the grant that we got 
is that uh, we have to we had to get give it to somebody that could distribute it. It had to be through a distribution network, like a um, needle distribution, needle exchange, okay? So the way that anybody can get it is all you have to do is call McCavin and you can go get it, okay? Not a problem, just go on over and get it, it's free. Um, or you can ask for it through your doctor and your doctor can get it for you for free. If you have Medi-Cal, your doctor can prescribe it and Medi-Cal will pay for it, okay? Or your insurance may pay for it or you can buy it for, and it costs usually between $75 to $150 for two doses, okay? And that's what you can do. Now, the other thing that you could do, um, what, we, what we're doing is we have some other doses that we have in reserve that we're trying to get doctors who have a number of patients who n might need it to call us and we will give them whatever they need so that we can get it out into the community as well. So we're taking a number of different approaches depending upon how much we have at any given time to get it out there in the community. But we just got it like two weeks ago. So this is brand new. So that kind of leads me into, uh, first, I don't want to forget that we're trying to get this into the hands of all first responders, and that would be like your sheriff. The police, Fort Bragg police, have actually done a whole course, and they're, they're on board and ready to go, you know, which is good because they're leading the rest of the, you know, EMTs, the fir uh, fire departments, and things like that. So we want to have it in the, in the hands of friends and family, right? Because when a person goes down, they can't help themselves. They're down and they're going to need help, right? Why do people do this? Why are they, you know, keep seeking these things? You know, addiction is um, personal to me. I have several of my own family, including myself, who's dealt with addiction. Addiction is not something that you just go, wake up someday and go, oh, I want to be an addict. I want to go ruin my life and ruin everyone's life around me. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and keep doing this until, like, what? Until somebody stops me. Um, it, that's not how that happens. Um, it happens gradually. Um, it's sneaky. It takes you by surprise. It took me by surprise. Um, I can tell you that as a kid, as a child growing up in Ukiah, my goals were to become a paralegal, and then I was going to become an attorney, and I was going to do great things with my life because I had a cause, right? I was coming off the reservation. I had lived in town. I had all these things that I wanted to stand up for, and um, it led from one thing to the next to the next, and the next thing you know, all those dreams, all those hopes were gone. And for me, um, getting clean, staying clean had a lot to do with this community. And the reason why I talk about it is because it's important to me. I need you to know that if it wasn't for the community of Mendocino County, I wouldn't be standing in front of you, right? I have, um, I have a program that I work. I have family and this community, actually, who put me back up on my feet. And it's taken a lot. It's taken a lot. And so to come out and talk about this and tell you, you know, why do people do this? Because it grabs a hold of their throat and doesn't let them go until it's done, right? And when it's done, people need somebody, right? They need support networks, right? They need people who care, you know? And, and they need to know that there's no shame in what's just happened to them. And it could be 20 years, it could be 30 years, and it could be the death of them or incarceration. So that's, that's my own little spin on how, it, how I see it. I, you know, I've lost a brother, and my brother was in and out of the hospital with a heart disease and a heart valve replacement, and when he was kicked out of the hospital, he wasn't getting those big high-powered opioids, right? And then he would come back, and he was sitting at home, and he got depressed, and he got lonely, and he's, you know, all these things started happening for him. And um, my brother eventually succumbed to this disease of addiction at the age of 38. You know, so is this close and personal to me? Yes, very much so. And I stand up here in front of you to tell you these things, not because I need your sympathy, but because I need you to come together as a community so that we can work together on this epidemic and find solutions. 
real solutions that are going to stick. Somebody asking something about naloxone recently, Narcan, were, they said something to me about, well, God, this person just, you know, it's like must be their fourth or fifth overdose, and, you know, and there was all this judgment in their voice, you know, and I had to turn around and I had to say to them, look, it doesn't matter how many times you have to use it. It doesn't matter how many doses they need to use because the next time could be the time that they turn around, right? And I said, it just doesn't matter. You just keep giving them the Narcan and making sure they have it, you know? And you keep pointing them in the right direction to the program. Well, they've already been through a program. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, because the next time might be the right time, right? And that's all you do. You just let go of the judgment, because that's not going to help at all. The support is, I'm going to give you, and it's hard to do sometimes, because being around an addict who's in the middle of their addiction is a hard thing. You know, it's not an easy thing. I've had plenty of addicts in my life. And still, the best thing you can do is say, take some naloxone home with you, please. Say, take some Narcan home with you, please. Or I'll have some in my pocket for the next time that you go down. And that's all you, you know, sometimes that's all you can do. That's harm reduction. So the question is, is for families or for friends of youth, mm -hmm. right, who are using that don't have prescriptions, um, the right way to go and get naloxone, right? Um, so the, the, the answer is, is, you know, contact McCavin first and, um, you know, and then talk to the doctor. You can also talk to your doctor. You can also go to the pharmacy and buy it, and you can call us. And, and we can, Kyrie can help you. And so when a person gets naloxone, right, and they bring it home, we want to encourage them to talk about it. I have this because you need to know, right? They go down. You need to be able to get in their purse or get in their bag or get in their pocket and wherever it's at and pull it out and use it for them so that they don't die because we don't know what a person's going to turn out to be, right? We have no idea. Prevention for the adults. Um, what we're doing is we're doing this. We're trying to get the information out there, give you as much st stats and things that we know that are happening and what's working. We're changing, helping work with the prescribers to change guidelines uh, on all kinds of things. So education, and then we're doing free lock bags. We don't just hand these out. We give a little education. We talk about how to use these lock bags. These are medication lock bags. And so they have a lock on the top here. There's a key inside the bag. You put the key in, you open it up, you put your meds in there. No emergency medication, right? Because if I'm having an asthma attack, I need to get my inhaler like right now. Not when oh, I'm trying to struggle to get this out. Or my, like if I need nitroglycerin so I don't have a heart attack, I need to be able to get it right away. So no emergency meds. So you'd put your meds in there, lock them up, and then you'd put, it comes with two keys. You'd put one key, you know, where you can get it easily, right? The other key, I suggest putting it up in a key where you have copies. Somebody told me this over the summer. I was like, what? Copies? That's a great idea. Right, because I've lost things. The other thing that we're so if you right, so if you keep if you keep extra sets of keys in a in a safe place, right, then you're able. If you lose your key, you're able to go make more copies. And so the purpose of the lock bag, that's a great question, is to keep medication out of the hands of our youth, or out of the hands maybe of the addict. Maybe it's the addict comes along and says, oh man. Can't, never mind. But if they're, well, you're going to have to get out some pretty tough scissors, right? And if your bag's cut, you know, you have a, a problem in the house, right? If your bag's gone, you really got a problem, right? Um, because normally what kids do, youth, they go in and they'll take a couple pills. And then they take off. And they're popping these pills. The, the kids are taking pills. They don't even know what they are, especially when they're pretty young. The other thing we're doing is... Um, we're doing drug take backs. We did one up here in Willits, uh, November, or Lee and I put on. We got a lot of medication, it was great. 
we had lots of great food and we had great entertainment and we did some education and we had some great kids. It was fun. And so we'll be coming back, right, in the, in the fall. Um, we're we're going to be in Willits and Fort Bragg. We're trying to go up to Covalo. We'll be going up to Laytonville and doing some work with the school. That's what I'm understanding. A lot of people have a lot of medication in their cabinets because they're unused, they're expired, and they're just stored up. Right, right. So at the Willits PD, there's one. And there's also one at the Sheriff's substation where you can drop medication. Right, we do not want to put it in our water system. And we don't want to put it in the toilet. Okay, and so with the youth, we're in the schools. We're working with MCOE, Mendocino County of Office of Education. Mendocino Community Youth Project is also in your schools. Working with the youth, uh, youth probation. What's PBIS? What's PBIS? PBIS is a school climate program that is in all of, is certainly in the Willits schools, um, should be in all of the schools and uh, is being done, was brought by MCOE. And uh, we've been working with them as well to include it in that. It's about everything. It's about not bullying. It's about everything. It's about, it's, a, it's slash school climate. It's about the entire school climate and how they want to create the school climate. And um, they're, inclu they're supposed to be including stuff about opioid prevention in that as well. And so we'll be working with the schools to do take back events with them also. So what we need from you, we need you to use a lock bag. If you have medication in your house, we need you to use this. I brought up a bunch of bags today if I run out, which I don't think I will. I think um, I have enough. Um, we want you to lock up your medication. I have um, one of these in my home. My son has one. Actually, so I have two of these in my home right? Because I have medication and then my son has medication. So we want you to educate your constituents, your doctors, your friends, your colleagues, your neighbors, your family, you know, and if you have questions and, and you can't answer them, you can always send them to Kyrie. Because <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I'll be busy at a, at, a, at a fun fair or something, tabling it. <laughs> Connect with the coalition. So our next coalition meeting is January 24th. It's at 8.30 in the morning at Public Health in Conference Room 1. We serve a light breakfast with coffee. And we always welcome fresh ideas, things that we can be working on together, helping me table events. And that's my contact information. SafeRx, Mendocino. If you have any seniors in your life that you know have lots of medications that need to be locked up, feel free. You can take one to them as well, okay? Because you're right, seniors are our number one source of medication for teens, believe it or not. Um, they go visit grandma or grandpa and full medicine cabinet. We'll do, go ahead and do the um, education piece. So the keys are inside, and you stick the key in the lock, open it up, stick your medication in there. Zip it over and let the tab fall over to the side. And then lock it down, take the key out, and now it's locked. And you obviously want to put this up in a safe place also, and then your keys. And that's it. It's pretty simple. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You're looking at the two people who've been doing all of the, P all of the opioid stuff, you know, and... And, and a coalition that's been working hard, you know, the prescribers have been working really hard. And the main coalition, they come and they show up and they do a little here and there, you know. But it's, uh, I need people who, who want to work on this issue. That's what I need. I need people who really are devoted to working on this issue and who want the what? Oh, the VISTAs. Oh, we just got a new grant. So we just got a new grant. This is very exciting. It hasn't started yet. This particular grant um, is two, they're paying for two VISTAs. You know what VISTAs are? Two American, then they're going to pay for two of them. So full-time VISTAs. Yes, it's a lot like an AmeriCorps uh, volunteer. So we are looking for two folks who would be interested in being VISTAs starting in April. So we're looking for them now. 
they need to be eight, it's on it's on the Facebook page. I believe they need to be 18 years or older. They don't get paid a lot. They do get a bit of a stipend. They get lots and lots of education and experience. And as soon as possible, if you th if you can think of anybody who might be interested, please send them that way. Okay? There is a physiological addiction that happens with opioids no matter who you are, no matter what your predisposition is. Now, if you have that predisposition to opioids, you may get it like that. I have heard people who are, say, heroin addicts or, you know, and the first time they did it, phew, they were gone. Or the first time they took, you know, uh, oxycodone. And they knew it. They were just gone, okay? And they had that predisposition, okay? But if you're on opiates for, you take OxyContin for two weeks, three times a day, you are going to develop a dependency on it, and you need to come off of it, okay? Now, is that going to be hard for you to do? It probably depends a little bit. Depends a little bit on your pain and how much pain you're still in. I would never take opiates for two weeks. Sometimes people are in the hospital and they're on pain, pain medication for two, three weeks, four weeks for, you know, they've been in a car accident. She's talking about her brother, been in a car accident. And, you know, they have to be on that medication for that period of time. And you're absolutely right. Depend, developed a dependency, ended up having to be in withdrawal. Absolutely. Okay? I totally get it. Absolutely. And he developed a dependency. And then he had to deal with withdrawal. So, yes, indeed. But that's what I'm saying. I, I can say that. I could say that, but if I ended up in a car accident and I was in, you know, and ended up with every, you know, broken bone from my waist down, I might well be in a, right? I might change my mind and then deal with having to come off of it and who knows what I'd end up having to deal with. Because you deal with what you get. But what I'm saying is, two weeks, you're going to be dependent, no matter who you are. Okay? So there's that. There is the nature of the drug, the, the chemical makeup of that drug. Okay? Marijuana doesn't have that nature. Okay? That's not it. Now, there's your addictive personality traits. Um, you can have that personality trait and use it addictively. Okay? Which is a different thing. Okay, and for most people who are addicts, um, sure, they usually start out with alcohol and marijuana and they keep going. That's true. So when you look at an addict's history, you're going to see them start with what is readily available. Somebody said to me once that heroin is the kind of thing you never want to try unless you want to be an addict. Because, yeah, it's... it's uh, it's that one-time thing. I think that there are a number of people out there who have been um, who have been addicted to prescription medication, who can no longer get their medications. Okay, partly because uh, doctors are decreasing the amount of medication they can get, and they are not ready for recovery. They are not ready for going on Suboxone or for coming down on their medications or their doctors just cutting them off or there are a wide number of reasons. And this can be for adults or for kids. doesn't matter. And yes, indeed, they are turning to heroin. Absolutely. And I think that it is the face of this next, the next face of the epidemic is what is heroin. And that is infinitely more dangerous because you don't know what you get when you buy that, that little bag of heroin. You know what you have when you're talking about a prescription. At least you know what's in it. It's very scary.
very scary. A lot of the people that have OD'd on opiates uh, were taking street heroin, which is so cut at times that sometimes people are putting fentanyl in it, and that that's one of the problems. The other thing I want to say is, in the late 60s, I worked at a private psychiatric hospital. We dealt with heroin addictions. And then later on, I worked at a halfway house for Vietnam vets coming back. And people were really freaked out because they said, well, these guys have been doing this really clean heroin over in Vietnam, and they're going to come over here, and they're not going to, you know, what are they going to do? And it was amazing how easy it was to get people off of heroin at that time mm. because the situation they were in was it being in Vietnam was creating the the environment that made them want to take heroin and when they got back and out of that situation they still wanted drugs I spent half the time convincing people no I was not going to get pot for them or speed or they wanted drugs but the heroin uh, withdrawal is not as bad as it was presented in the 60s, where people were tearing sheets apart and all this kind of stuff. It's really, there's a mythology about heroin addiction that actually should be broken through too in these discussions, I think. And part of it is that the street stuff that people were buying because they could no longer get the opiates is, you know, could be anything. And, and, and that could cause the overdose. Yes, yes, yeah. Fentanyl has just started to hit uh, our county, and um, that's also a very terrifying thing. Now, unless you're a chemist, there's no way to know what you're getting. You know, you can cut flour or sugar into it, or you can put fentanyl in it, or you can put rat poison in it. In fact, you know, there was um, a period of time not that long ago when the uh, emergency room in Ukiah was seeing tremendous number of people coming in with um, abscesses. And that was because uh, somebody had, had put a batch of heroin on the street with rat poisoning in it, and it was creating abscesses. You cut it with anything. But they were still doing it. Thank you so much.